Okay, so now we will go from the global onset to the more individual perspective. I would like to bring up to the stage Per and Tassara, please. Welcome. <laughs> so I would like to say just one thing, that there are difficulties and there are opportunities in the labor market. And when you put your ears to the ground and listen to prospective candidates and employers in the labor market, you might get something like what we're going to hear right now. The, the stage is yours, please. Thank you, Madeleine, and thank you, Mitli, for having me back. Uh, during, between my two Volvo employments, I was a management consultant. As a management consultant, you get to know different industry sectors, you get to know different markets, and you address a lot of the issues that are on senior managers' agendas from time to time. But it also means that you become an expert in being rejected. As a management consultant, you pitch. And you pitch very often in competition and if you're good and well prepared, you win one out of three. If you're in a flow and life is beautiful, you win one out of two. If you're ill prepared, you might win one out of four or one out of five. But after last year's Mid Leave Symposium, I've been thinking a lot about that. What have been the impact on me if my hit rate was zero? So last time I spoke about the importance of diversity and inclusion for competitiveness. I talked about the fact that the one plus one is always bigger than two, but only as long as the one and the other one are different. I talked about the fact that diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams time after time after time. And that is really the reason why I, as head of strategy, spend a lot of time talking about diversity and inclusion. If you're good at this, you probably grow faster, you have higher returns, you have higher employee engagement, and you have more satisfied customers than your competition. And I try to practice what I preach. So, in June last year, my boss called me and he said, I need to fill a vacant position on Monday with one of your team members. Bosses can do that, right? <laughs> uh, so there I was and I realized I need to fill that position before we go on holiday because I need a person in place when we return in August. So I turned to meet leave and I said, I, I gave them the, the job description. I said I need at least 20 good CVs by Friday. <laughs> I got 16. And I sat down with a colleague and went through them all. And we said, all 16 can do the job. All 16 add something to the team that we're missing. All 16 seems to be likable people. So we selected four for interviews the following week. Having met three, we looked at ourselves and said, this will be a headache <laughs> to choose. But then we met Sarah. Sarah, come join me. <laughs> Sarah from uh, Sri Lanka who had a bachelor from New York at University, a master from Lund in innovation management, but most importantly, she more or less grew up in a truck workshop. And for those of you who know anything about our industry, you know that's the truck workshop, that's where we provide uptime and that's where we build loyalty. So that was your unique selling proposition, sir. <laughs> But you were then the, you were part of Midley program. What was it like? Yes, um, I was a mentee and it has been an insightful journey. 
when I first applied, actually I didn't get a spot because it's such a competitive program. But then when I got a spot, I was so glad because the mentors have been truly incredible. And as a mentee, I got to learn about different aspects of the Swedish culture, industry trends, and even have conversations about economics and geopolitics. So I would say it has been a great journey so far. So what were the most important learnings? I would say that you have to keep going. And it is not necessary to have an entire network from the get-go, but you build connections slowly and trustfully, and also believe in your potential and be authentic to your identity. Because in the process of getting a job, it can be quite tough. It's many cold shoulders and many rejections. But then you meet this one person who's willing to listen to you and believe in your potential, and this person makes the biggest impact. So, Sarah, you have an audience. Anything you would share with them? Yes, um, I'd love to say if you have the time to be a mentor in the program, it makes such a big difference to a mentee. Even to have a short conversation about maybe an industry-specific topic or the culture in general. And if you're a mentee, I would say keep going, keep reaching out, and keep believing in your potential, because there's a lot of people working very hard to make the labor market really inclusive and also more receptive to diverse talent. So I hope you will soon meet that one person who believes in your potential very soon. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Let's have a look at the people who didn't get the job. This is what they're doing today. We have four what I would call professional job seekers. We have four that work for Swedish aid organizations. Yes, we have a CEO here. He's in Syria. And the ground is burning under his feet to get back to Sweden. But if I put on my old management consulting hat and start to look at these people, they speak 19 languages. And if you add them up, they can talk to 6 billion people in the world. And they have lived, studied, and worked on all continents. You have eight, eight men and seven women. We have seven masters in engineering, including renewable energy, entrepreneurship. We have seven MBAs, marketing, finance. We have one law degree. They have tons of other academic merits. The Liv Ullman Honorary Service Award for humanitarian work. Best master thesis, best student, things like that. They are highly digital. They work with everything from SAP, ERP, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and on top of that, they can write code. For a management consulting firm, that is an advantage. Get the promotion, sir. They have lots of other skills. Project management, they can take you through the Swan labeling, they know Lead, Bream, Scrum, Agile, Six Sigma, life cycle analysis, accounting, chartered accountant. Looking at their work experience, it spans a huge sector. Banking, retail, automotive, consulting, roles have been project management, leadership roles. They've been in support functions like IT, HR, finance. And if I was a management consulting firm, I would group this as sector expertise. So we know professional services, we know manufacturing, we know international agencies, we know the public sector. And if I put this then together, 
I would create the consulting team 113, a highly skilled boutique consulting firm, experts on finding solutions in an ever more fragmented world. <laughs> and not only that, we engage with clients in go-to-market strategy and we do it fluently with six billion consumers. We can do design to value, we can do digital and data transformation. We can do supply chain resilience on any continent. We can do pricing strategies with the raising inflation and we can help you with your sustainability strategy starting with the life cycle analysis. Hmm? So according to recent report from the Swedish ICT industries, we're lacking 75,000 tech talents in this, com in this country. And like I said last time, change, and which a number of the speakers before me have said, change is not that you change corporate culture. Change starts with brave individuals who start to do things differently. Right in front of you, you have a massive, fantastic talent pool. If we as leaders don't use that talent pool, we're not doing our job properly. But you can be that person, not to help these 15 academics, because they will make it. They have everything that it takes. No, you should do it in order to help your organization be that person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. And come up, Sarah, as well. I just have one question. Uh, first and foremost, where was that consultancy firm when I was 10 years younger? <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of 10 years younger, I was actually a mentee, as uh, Sarah uh, as Fia mentioned earlier, in Mitlis' program, and we talked about this earlier, that 10 years ago, we were talking about the same things. You know, I was in a cohort with students. Nobody could get a job that was qualified. Everybody was overqualified. And today, we're talking about the exact same thing. So my question to the both of you, we can start with you, Carl, is you mean you have mentioned so many answers to this, to this complex problem, but why do you think it's not going faster? Which word should I use? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when we spoke about this yesterday, I said to Sarah, I will say that we're lazy, but then we changed it to complacent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also risk avert, because if I si hire someone who looks like me, talks like me, comes from the same school as me, I know exactly what I get. Uh, but I'm not getting the best potential for the group and for the job we have at hand. What do you think, Sarah, from your perspective? I definitely agree. And I think it's a matter of being open-minded and also being receptive to diverse talent. Because I understand, as Per said, it's so easy to hire somebody from your circle. But it proven all over again, and as we saw, over and over again, diverse teams do perform better. So do yourselves a favor, I would say. Thank you, and thank you both very much for a lovely thank presentation. You.